Uh, nice to be here. My name is Yannick. I'm from BrainBot, and I'm here with uh, Kevin from the Ethereum Foundation. And we're going to talk a little bit about P2P and networking in Ethereum 2.0, or how we call it now in Serenity. I will um, start and give a little bit um, of background and um, try to introduce you to the problem that we're trying to solve, and then um, and also show some simulations um, to see if our approach makes somewhat sense. And then I will hand it over to Kevin, um, who will talk about the implementation of um, all that stuff. But let's start uh, with the very basic things, um, our goals of networking, what we actually want to do. We have some nodes that produce data, and others want to obtain this data, so we need a way to distribute this. And that way, the way how we want to do this, should, it should be efficient, it should be uh, fast, and it should also be safe. Um, what kind of data in, in the original Ethereum? It's uh, mostly transactions and blocks, and the important thing here is that um, all nodes basically download the same data, so there's no distinction at all. Basically, all nodes do the same thing. Um, in Serenity, things get different, mostly because of sharding. Uh, and sharding means we basically split the data up into different um, shards, and one particular node only downloads the data for that particular shard. So um, that way, we can save a lot of, of bandwidth. I plotted uh, in this picture, it's eight. In reality, it's 1,000. But a thousand are too many to uh, to draw in this picture, but just to uh, yeah. Um, in addition to this shard data, we also still need some kind of global data that all nodes download. This is um, the beacon chain data. Um, from that, we can basically infer um, how nodes should connect to other nodes. Uh, in original uh, Ethereum, um, all nodes basically are the same, so one node simply basically picks randomly uh, from the set of all nodes uh, and connects to them. In uh, Serenity, things will be different. Uh, if you pick peers, you first look at uh, what shard you're assigned to or what shard you want to download. Um, in this, this example, shard three. And then you pick peers from that shard um, so that you, they can give you useful information. So here we have uh, three additional nodes from shard three. And then in addition to that, we pick um, nodes from the global set uh, um, that can provide you with um, beacon data, in this example, one and seven. And then uh, we can basically abstract from that. Essentially what you do is uh, we now have two networks, and in one is the shard network, uh, which consists of all the nodes that are connected to um, a certain shard and are connected to each other. Uh, and then we have the beacon network um, th that consists of all the different nodes, um, and in this network only the beacon data is um, transmitted. Now another thing that's different um, to the existing Ethereum network is that we have a new class of nodes called the validators. Um, they are quite similar to um, normal nodes in that sense that they uh, are interested in the data that uh, belongs to a certain shard. But in addition to that, um, uh, in, what's different to them is that they only care about the recent history. So they don't, don't, don't download uh, like the whole chain up until Genesis, but only the recent history. And uh, another thing that's different is that they switch regularly between shards. Um, because they basically get assigned to a new shard, uh, which they are supposed to, to validate uh, uh, randomly. And a third thing that's different is that they want not, they want not uh, that the rest of the network knows that they are validator or, uh, or which validator they are, because they uh, stake some, um, um, some ether, and so they want to have extra protection, and if people would know that they are validator, they might, might get um, attacked. Now that's basically all we, uh, um, all the changes we have. Uh, now we need to think about what protocols we have. Uh, basically, we, there are three functionalities. And the first one is we need a way to find suitable peers. And that's done by a discovery protocol. The second, a second thing we need to do is to distribute data. And we do this using a gossip protocol. And uh, finally, for new no uh, nodes that jo uh, join the network or validators that um, are assigned to a new network, a uh, new shard, they need a way to synchronize in the chain um, or the, re uh, the history of the chain using RPC calls. Um, I will not talk about the last thing because that's basically the, um, there's basically no difference to uh, how Ethereum 1.0 does it, uh, but I will focus on gossiping and the discovery protocol. 
So what's gossiping? Gossiping is a very simple peer-to-peer um, -peer protocol that's being used in a lot of um, um, projects, including Bitcoin and including Ethereum 1.0. Um, the idea is we have one node in the network that has produced some data, and it wants to inform the rest of the network um, of that data. So what uh, they, they do is they pick a random peer um, and send this data to them. And now we have two peers that know the data. And in the second round, they basically do the same thing again. They um, pick randomly new peers and send the data to them. They um, do this a couple of times, and after a few rounds, uh, the whole network knows the data. And that's a very simple uh, and uh, yeah, aesthetic protocol that's also um, very efficient. And the, this process is also very fast and safe in case of uh, network failures. Um, we want to apply this in, uh, in two different settings, gossiping, once in the shard networks and once in the beacon network. The difference between these two settings is that in the shard networks, we only have few nodes because they um, yeah, distribute themselves over um, the whole set of nodes, distributes themselves um, over the different shards. But uh, we have uh, comparatively high throughput. Uh, so a lot of data is uh, transmitted there. And in the beacon network, we have a lot of nodes because all of the nodes in the network participate here, um, but um, it's uh, much, much less data. So we did some simulations uh, to basically uh, answer two questions. Uh, the first one is, can the network handle, is, handle um, our, uh, the numbers we have or the, the, the settings we have? And how fast does it, uh, is the propagation? How much time does it take to propagate uh, data? And to do this, we implemented, uh, we needed an implementation and we used Gossip Sub um, that's been designed by Lippy2P and we, uh, which we will probably or most likely will use in the end. Um, and we implemented that. And then another thing we need, if we do simulations, we need to uh, make sure that they um, represent reality in some sense. Um, and in particular, we need to know what um, the, the connections of the, that the nodes have with each other, what, what bandwidth they have. And fortunately, there's a scientific paper that has measured this, um, and we just um, picked those numbers from the uh, current Ethereum network. And here's what we got. We um, basically looked at the, uh, how much time it takes to, uh, the propagation of a, of a message through the network um, over time. So at the at beginning, time zero, no one knows the network, so, uh, no one knows the message. The, net, uh, the message is created at time zero, and then it, it starts to be transmitted or propagates through the network, and at some point it reaches one, meaning that the, um, the whole network has seen the message. And we did this for a couple of block sizes. Uh, one thing I forgot, this is for, for a shard, so for a single shard network where we have maybe a thousand nodes. Um, and the numbers we get here is, so first, the first thing we see is that it works. So um, it's not like uh, it takes forever or it uh, does never reaches one. Um, messages are always transmitted. And the larger the block size, of course, the longer it takes. But for a small block size of 100 kilobytes, maybe it takes two seconds. And for larger ones, it gets longer and longer. But um, even one megabyte is still eight seconds. Um, now, another thing we should look at is um, what bandwidth is actually used. Um, and we see here, this is a histogram of all the nodes uh, and how much data, uh, how, how much of, what fraction of their uh, bandwidth they use. We see that most, most nodes use about 20% of their bandwidth and uh, some a little bit more, but no nodes use more than 60% of their bandwidth. This is um, important because it tells us basically two things. The first one is that we are not um, operating at capacity, even at large block sizes. Uh, so um, um, if there were nodes that use 100% of their bandwidth, we, would be, uh, we could be pretty sure that they will not keep up uh, in the long run. And this is not what's happening. The second thing is we see that there's a lot of bandwidth available if we get new nodes that join the network and download uh, new data. Uh, and shards that download the data, well, because this only simulates um, the propagation of data that's created newly and not um, synchronization of chain, uh, chains and so on. So that's good. And now we looked at uh, the Beacon uh, network where we have a lot more nodes. Um, I simulated here 100,000 nodes. Um, 
And we see the same thing basically, at time zero a block is created and it propagates through the network and it, at some point it reaches all the nodes. Um, block sizes are smaller here, 64 kilobytes to 512 kilobytes. We will see uh, how large they will be in the end. Um, and here, even though the network is much larger, we still get propagation times of um, a couple of seconds. So this seems to work very well and we are happy with that. Peer discovery, um, that's more complicated. Um, and the job of peer discovery is to find peers in the beacon network and also to find peers in a specific shard. And this is uh, the challenging, or one of the challenging points here, because there are a lot of shards, and if you just pick a random node in the network, you need to pick a lot of them to find one that's suitable to you. So we would like to have a way that's more efficient than that. Um, we also need, uh, this also should be very fast, so that validators who, is, who are assigned to a new shard can start operating as quickly as possible, so that the dead time is as short as possible. And a uh, fourth requirement is that um, the validators, as I said earlier, they would like to be private, and if it's easy to discover them using this discovery protocol, then yeah, this is not good. Um, we are considering um, a bunch of options here. Um, uh, three uh, are, seem to be viable. Um, the first one is Discovery version 5. It has been um, designed by uh, Felix from the Ethereum Foundation uh, to be used in the existing Ethereum network, but it actually has some nice properties, meaning that we can, could maybe use it for us as well, so, um, and it looks very promising, I think. Second one is a simple variation of Kademlia, and the third one is to simply use a global gossiping channel to um, Propagate um, the shards we or the um, yeah the shard preferences in some sense, which seems kind of uh, boot forth, but it uh, it might actually be viable. Uh, but we we are still not finished with that. We're still evaluating. Um, yeah, but that's it from my side. And now Kevin will talk about uh, implementation. Um, hello everyone, I'm, I'm Kevin, and I'm going to introduce the P2P implementation status on our side. So this project is named uh, Sharding P2P POC, and it is a proof of concept of the current design for Ethereum 2.0 P2P layer, and we implement it using the P2P. So what is the lib P2P? And it is a library that has many useful peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networking components. So you can choose the components you want or you need to build your own peer-to-peer -peer applications. And currently we're using the TCP components and the Kademlia DHT and PubSub. And the goal of our project is we want to see if uh, our current design meets the needs of Ethereum 2.0. And we also want to see if the P2P fits our needs. And it can also serve as a temporary layer for Ethereum 2.0 network Python implementation until the Python lib P2P implementation is ready. So the requirement for our um, networking layer for Ethereum 2.0 um, the clients should be able to subscribe one, to one or more shards. So in this graph, the clients subscribe to two shards, one is black and one is red. And the client should only receive the data uh, from the shards it has subscribed. So in this case, the client should only receive the block in black and red instead of the blue one. And the time to subscribe to a shard should be short which means uh, a node should be able to find the sharp peers in a short time. So the design, currently we map the shards to topics in PubSub. So the concept of the PubSub is uh, subscribers subscribe to some sh topics and they should only receive the data published to those topics. In this way, each topic forms a separate channel so we can segregate the uh, shards with the topics. And about discovery, we use blue nodes for new nodes to join the network and to find the um, initial peers. 
and we use Kademnia DHT, and we, for to discover the sharp peers, uh, our current approach is we have a global topic for nodes to broadcast the shards they're currently subscribing. So if a node wants to um, to find a peer in a sp specific shard, it has it, it can do it uh, through subscribing the topic. And we're still exploring other options. And each node provides the RPC for other nodes to request for data. So currently we support the request collation. Collation is the block in the shard. And we're going to change to use the LibidTV daemon. So what is a LibidTV daemon? Uh, it is capable of supporting LibidTV across languages. And you, if you want to use it, you need to implement the bindings. So as you can see in this graph, the left-hand side is the LibidTV daemon. And it is a standalone process, and it handles the LibidTV components and you can control the daemon through the uh, Unix domain socket. And in, currently, it supports uh, multiple methods. So the ident identify, you can get a peer ID from the daemon, and you can connect to other peers, and you can open streams to other peers, and you can set up, a, you can register a function to handle the incoming streams. And the DHT, DHT operations, and the um, pops up still on the ways. And this graph shows how we will change our structure. So uh, in this graph, the blue ones means um, the part we need to implement. Um, and the left hand side is still the goal, and right hand side is Python. So currently, we implement our logics both in Go and Python, and we we handle the communication through gRPC. And we're changing to use libp2p daemon. And in this way, we can move all of our logics to Python side, and we need to implement the Python bindings. And after libp2p is ready, we can use it directly. So um, all of the logics will be off all of them will be in Python side. And about the implementation status, so we have finished the essential functionalities, so including the joining, subscribing to the shards, and broadcast data to the shards and request messages. And we have a global topic for discovery and content validations, and we have a tracing for the testing. And um, we have the bindings of our code for Python. And what's in progress? So um, the white block team, they're supporting us to do the um, testing with um, networking, network, network emulation. And we're still doing our own deployment and testing uh, for a testnet. And we also, we are also implementing the Python libp2p daemon bindings. And we still have to finish the peer management and reputation mechanism and do the further optimization for the overlay. And we currently will have cooperations with the original Ethereum P2P designers. And we got a lot of advice from them. And the protocol labs, they support us on the P2P and pops up. Um, white block help us to do, to to um, to do the testing things, and that's it. So I want to give credits to Felix and um, from Felix and Anton from EF. They gave us a lot of um, instructions and my uh, the great work from my colleagues. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, if anybody in the audience has any questions, well, there's one right now. Was the propagation data you showed and bandwidth utilization data based on testing on a local area network or a global network? Uh, neither. So it was, uh, it was a simulation. It was running all on one machine, but we simulated the, the latency and the bandwidth between these nodes. Based on a global, global network latency? Yes. Hi. Um, my question is, I know before, there's the, peer to, the dev P2P implementation, and now there's the it 2.0. My question is, 
um, if the previous implementation is kind of going to, everything is going to be switched into lib P2P or there's going to be different areas there. So in the dev P2P right now, there's no lib P2P implementation. There's uh, Academia for discovery, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in this version, you're showing that lib P2P is kind of everywhere. Yes. So, so our current plan is to use just use lib P2P and not use dev P2P for the um, serenity stuff. And you're going for the Go implementation in lib P2P? Yeah. Um, currently, yeah. But okay. we have a grant for the Python lib P2P implementation. So after it is ready, uh, because we, we implement in Python, so after it is ready, we can change to that. So other, and this yeah. is why you also have the the Unix uh, the daemon, right? Yeah, the daemon is to solve this problem. So you can communicate um, for different languages. They can use the daemon, and without the implement, without the actual lib to be is implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? Are there any comments from the audience? <laughs> They like it. Thank you. They like you guys. All right, great. That's it. Round of applause for me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.